Have you ever wanted a robot friend? You know, that iconic robot from your childhood that you always wished that you could bring to life. If only there were some sort of YouTube channel dedicated to bringing those types of things into reality. And I'm not talking about those guys. I, I can't afford to build any of those robots. I'm talking about this guy right here. And you might think that Claptrap is just a pathetic box on a wheel with spindly, fragile little arms and a sad, simple lens for an eye, incapable of expressing deep emotion. And you'd be right. But behind all of that is a remarkably complex machine. Well, actually, the game model's pretty simple. There's not a whole lot going on in there. But in my design, my Claptrap will be a bit more complicated because I am attempting to build my very own self-balancing Claptrap robot. Now, even if you've never played the Borderlands franchise, hopefully that entices you because it turns out building a unicycle robot is really hard. In fact, it's so hard that I've split him up into 10 smaller problems that I need to solve in order to bring him to life. So let's talk about the first problem, which is balance. How is he going to balance on one wheel? So in order for a claptrap to balance, I need a special kind of wheel. And I've got it right here. This is a 10 inch hub motor rated for 800 watts. And this is basically an electric go-kart wheel. And what's special about this is that the motor is built into the hub, hence hub motor, which means I don't have to worry about any sort of uh, transmission or anything like that. Now, originally I wanted to use an actual one wheel because, hey, I'm building a one wheeled robot. Why don't I just use something off the shelf? Well, it turns out those are really expensive, even used. So I ordered the finest 10 inch hub motor that I could find for $150. And now that I've got the motor figured out, I can scale the rest of his body and start designing his chassis. Since this gives us a scale for his design. So each side of the motor is mounted to a right angle bracket that mounts to a spacer that bolts to a hefty base plate. This is already a departure from the game because as you can see, Claptrap has a noticeably soft and dynamic suspension, but this is a prototype and the simplest option is just to have him rigidly coupled to his frame. I'll worry about a suspension later. And I think it'll work just fine. But this is only the first piece of the puzzle because he's a monowheel and he needs to turn in place. But how do I even do that? If we watch Claptrap in game, you'll notice he's able to turn in place without moving against anything, which is seemingly impossible, but it can be done. It turns out this need to rotate against something without pushing against anything is a common problem and it's already been solved. If you just don't see the solution often here on Earth. There's no ground to rotate against in space and satellites need to orient themselves all the time. Now you might think that uh, they use gas thrusters and of course they do and you usually see this depicted in TV and movies because it looks dramatic but that's not practical all the time because if you're using a thruster, you're ejecting something and that something is a finite resource. Ideally, you could convert electrical power into a torque that could change your angular momentum and position you precisely. And there is a device that does just that and it's called a reaction wheel. In simple terms, a reaction wheel is just a rotating mass that spins opposite the direction you want something to spin. Due to conservation of angular momentum, if you have that rotating mass attached to your chassis and rotated clockwise, the chassis will move counterclockwise. There's more to it than that. It obviously, it depends on how fast you're accelerating, the mass and size of the reaction wheel, and the mass and size of the thing you're trying to rotate. But that's the gist of what I'm trying to accomplish. And it's a proven mechanism for getting things to turn in place. And for my reaction wheel, I went with this off the shelf drum brake, which is affordable and it's heavy and it's designed uh, almost ideally as a reaction wheel, even though that's not the point. It's got a nice mounting pattern so I can create a hub, which is important because I've got this mounted at the top of Claptrap's head and that connects to a long shaft, which connects to a pulley, which connects to a timing belt, which is coupled to a motor. This configuration does two things. One, it allows me to swap out motors or transmission ratios so I can see what works. Also, it keeps the reaction wheel at the top of Claptrap's head, which is important because it means he'll have more inertia, which means he'll fall over slower, and that will mean he'll be easier to balance. So obviously, I'm not the first person to design a unicycle robot. And most people, when they want to stabilize the robot in roll, they just use a reaction wheel that's in line with that roll axis. So that's totally plausible and uh, elegant, but reaction wheels aren't the most efficient. And I want this 
bill to be an excuse to learn a lot of new things. So I'm going to use a different mechanism that is a bit more complicated, but I think looks really cool. And it's called a CMG. To explain, let's take a look at a model. If I spin up a flywheel and put that on a gimbal, we've now got a gyroscope. If we can actively control that gimbal, we've got a control moment gyroscope or an SGCMG. And if we have a pair of SGCMGs where the gyroscopes are rotating in opposite directions and the gimbals move in opposite directions, we can create a torque perpendicular to the axis of the gimbal in one direction, depending on which way we're accelerating them in the scissored pair, which in my case would be Claptrap's roll axis. Now, there's a lot more to this than I'm covering, but it would take an entire dedicated video to explain how and why this works. And if you want to learn more about control moment gyroscopes in a separate video for my design, let me know in the comments below. So how am I going to make my own control moment gyroscope? Well, I've already got this nice, beautiful brushless DC motor, and this is powerful and compact but it doesn't have a lot of moment of inertia. It's not designed to. So I want to add a flywheel so there's a larger uh, rotating mass. Now, initially, I thought I was just going to use some off-the-shelf flywheels. This is a motorcycle flywheel, and it's nice and compact, but uh, I want the motor to fit inside the flywheel because I want this to be as thin as possible because I want more room for activities inside my chassis. There's a lot going on in there. Ideally, I could turn down uh, this flywheel, but I don't have a metal lathe. I have something better. The combined manufacturing output of today's sponsor, JLC PCB, and so do you. Now, in addition to offering high quality PCBs and stencils, they also offer cutting edge 3D printing and CNC services. Obviously, I was enticed by the CNC services, so I asked JLC PCB if they could help me out, and they sent over these beautiful brass flywheels and they're absolutely gorgeous but they might look right but are they dimensionally accurate that's really important so let's bust out the calipers that's all within tolerance and more importantly look at that it's just so clean i'm really excited to test these out and this is absolutely not something I could fabricate in my home shop. So if you are constrained by your own tools and just want someone else to make professional, uh, perfect parts for you, go ahead and check out my link in the description for JLC PCB. Thanks again, guys, for sponsoring this video and thank you for the flywheels. Let's get back to our design of Claptrap. Okay, so now that I've figured out most of the core balancing mechanisms that take up a lot of the space in this chassis, I can focus on the important but still functional aspects of Claptrap's design like his eye. Now his eye is pretty straightforward and I've split my design into three key parts. We've got the lens body itself, the hemispherical base, and the pan and tilt mechanism. But how's it actually broken down? The lens body is a 3D printed tube with a lip that retains the lens itself. The tube has large inner threads for an inner plate. This plate acts as a mount for the inner main eye LED. The threads will allow me to dial in the distance between the LED and the lens so that I get just the right amount of diffusion. Now the lens itself isn't directly attached to the hemispherical base, and that's for good reason, because Claptrap is going to fall and bump into things a lot. I've designed this in a special way to add a little bit of shock absorption. So I added five springs to the rear of the lens body that line up with the base of his eye. This way his eye can take at least some impact without just shattering. How well would this actually work? I don't know, but uh, it can't hurt, can it? Now at the base, we've got the pan and tilt mechanism. So the eye and hemisphere assembly is mounted on a universal joint, and that is attached to crank arms that are attached to servos. This is pretty much the exact same mechanical setup I used in Wheatley's eye and face design. So I know it will work just fine. This one's just a bit more robust because his eye is a lot larger and heavier. Next up, we've got another important feature of Claptrap's aesthetic, and that is his disk drive. Now, I call it a disk drive, but I don't recall ever actually seeing him put a disk in there. He usually just pops it out to express himself or to retrieve stored items like echo devices from within his body. But it's important, and I want to create a motorized version for my Claptrap, so here's how I broke that down. 
I split the mechanism into three main parts. We've got the rigid door assembly with the front face and label insert. This mounts to two long 3D printed strips that are attached to drawer slides. There's also a plate to cross brace the two slides so that there's minimal twisting. One slide has a herringbone gear rack that mates with the pinion gear on a servo motor that tucks away neatly in this 3D printed block mounted at the base of the chassis. The rack extends almost all of the way out the rear so that I get the maximum amount of travel. Now this is only one of the linear mechanisms that I've designed in Claptrap's body, the other being his antenna mechanism. Claptrap's antenna is an iconic part of his character model. And while it doesn't do much, it does light up and it does extend and retract depending on whether or not Claptrap's scared or powered down. And I wanted to incorporate that to my design because it's not too complicated and I don't have to reinvent anything. I'm basically just using the same linear mechanism design you'd find in the Z axis of a 3D printer. And in my model, I've got the antenna itself, which rides on a linear bearing that's fixed at the top of Claptrap's head. The antenna mounts to a carriage that has a flanged lead screw nut and another linear bearing that rides on a steel rod that is fixed to the chassis. When the lead screw rotates, I can move the carriage and antenna up or down. To drive the lead screw, I've coupled it to another servo that mounts to a 3D printed piece that fixes it to the chassis. To keep things tidy, this piece also secures the motor for another key feature, his kickstand. All right, I get it. Claptrap is never modeled with a kickstand, but he's a balancing robot. And that means when he's powered down, he needs some way to stay upright. In the game, he just retracts his wheel into his body. And I actually think that's mechanically plausible, but that's really complicated and not something I'm gonna do in the very first prototype. So I need to have another way to keep him upright and I designed a motorized kickstand that I think will do the job. In my design, I've modeled this 180 degree hinge mechanism that is mounted to a door over his rear body panel. This door has a cylindrical rubber bumper so that it has some grip when deployed on the ground and the attachment points are made of TPU so it's a little bit flexible. The hinge mechanism is pretty much symmetrical on the other side, except there's just a set of bearings instead of a motor. Is this accurate to the game model? No, but I need it and more importantly, it looks cool. The next iconic element of Claptrap's design I need to figure out is his hand assembly. And thankfully, his hands aren't that mechanically complicated. He doesn't have fingers or anything like that. He just has these two little flaps. And unfortunately, they don't have any modeled motors, just like most video game robots. So I need to figure out a way to actuate these that hides the motor somewhere else because I don't have room to stick a motor in the actual joint. I've gone ahead and added gear teeth to the base of each flap. This way they move together and I'll only need to actuate one side to open or close his hands. To actually make the paddles move, I've added a weak extension spring to one side that mounts inside his wrist. The distance from the mounting point on the wrist and the hand is longer than the spring itself, so that it's always spring-loaded closed. To make it open, I've wrapped a Kevlar cable around the other handle and over the steel guide pin. So the cable is more aligned with the hollow tube of his forearm. This cable goes through the tube, into his elbow, and out his shoulder up to a small motor with the pulley. When the cable is retracted, his hand opens, and when it's relaxed, the spring takes up the slack and his hand closes. Now I've got a lightweight and compact hand mechanism that is easy to control, and more importantly, hides the motor somewhere else. This is Claptrap's bicep. Impressive, right? But it gets the job done. And that job is to resist the ever-present crushing force of gravity, because I need a mechanism just like the hand that hides the motor somewhere else. But the elbow is a little bit different. Here, we've got Claptrap's upper arm and forearm. The elbow itself is this little clevis assembly. There are bearings that press fit on either side of the clevis and screws that ride in the bearings that screw into the forearm allowing it to swivel freely. To actuate this assembly, I have designed a fixed anchor point on the inside of the forearm, a guide at the base of the upper arm, and a sliding anchor that rides in a dovetail on the sheath of the upper arm. A steel cable attaches to the forearm anchor, loops under the guide, and attaches to Claptrap's bicep spring, which attaches to the sliding anchor. That anchor has a small set screw so that I can adjust the tension on the spring and get just enough force to counterbalance the weight of his hand and forearm. So now it's spring-loaded closed, but to extend his elbow, I've designed a path for another Kevlar cable that wraps around the elbow pin and down into his upper arm so that it can be driven by a larger servo in the shoulder, just like the hand mechanism. 
Moving up the arm, we come to the most mechanically complex part of the design, Claptrap's shoulder, or his armpit, depending on how you look at it. And it has a differential mechanism, but probably not one that you've seen before. In my case, the output shaft is this metal tube with a miter gear fixed on one end. This tube rests on two bearings mounted in this large U-shaped bracket, which rotates on the input shafts, which each have their own miter gear. There isn't enough room for a motor to attach directly to the input shafts, so each shaft has a pulley that is driven by a timing belt that connects to the motor shaft. When I rotate the arm, both of the input shafts are moving clockwise, and when I lift the arm up, they're rotating in different directions. This does make it more complicated to assemble and program, but once again, it looks cool, and it will make him more powerful, so I think this is the better option. This is really just an overview. You tell me in the comments which part of this design you'd like me to expand on, and I'll make a dedicated video about it. But I'm going to be making multiple videos because there are so many things to explain and explore when building a large-scale unicycle robot. And as always, thank you to my patrons for supporting me. I know my upload schedule is not really a schedule. And uh, yeah, subscribe, stick around for the next one, and I'll see you guys in, in the next one. Bye.